Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. If you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming interviews, you can subscribe to our newsletter on the homepage of mpatient.org or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And please share these interviews with your myeloma friends. For today's show, we are very excited to have with us and fortunate to have one of the top myeloma researchers, Dr. James Radner, with us. So welcome, Dr. Radner. Hello, Jetty. Thanks for the invitation to join you. Well, I will give a short introduction. It's hard to keep this one short, but I will try okay. um, about, about you. So Dr. James Bradner is a staff physician in the Division of Hematologic Malignancies at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, as well as an Associate Professor in Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also Associate Director in the Center for the Sciences of Therapeutics at the Broad Institute. Dr. Bradner is scientific founder of Tensha Therapeutics and Cyrus Pharmaceuticals, is on a lengthy number of Harvard, Dana-Farber, and Brigham and Women's Committees, and is on the National Board of Directors for the LLS and additional L- Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Committees. He's the Development Committee Chair for ASH and is on review boards for the MMRF, the Samuel Waxman Research Foundation, the Leukemia Research Foundation, the LLS, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. He is an ad hoc reviewer for over 15 major hematology publications and has received numerous awards, including the Ash Scholar Award, Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation Innovation Award, and the Nakata Award from the University of Pittsburgh, just to name a few. Dr. Bradner leads the very large Bradner Lab, which studies gene regulatory pathways using the newer discipline of chemical biology. So with with that, which is amazing, um, let's get started with our show today and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is, is the important reason that Dr. Bergsogel mentioned MIC as one of the as the most common myeloma translocation, and then he mentioned your work to target that translocation. So, can you give us a little bit of background about about? MIC, why you chose MIC as a target, the importance of MIC, and maybe give us a little refresher about MIC and myeloma. Absolutely. And Jenny, thanks for that invitation, uh, in, introduction, which is just hysterical. Um, uh, you've clearly been talking to my mother. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, when I, um, uh, sort of an accidental um, chemist uh, or discovery chemist, I trained, as you said, as a, as a hematologist. Um, and uh, taking care of myeloma patients on the wards, um, training with uh, Ken Anderson and Paul Richardson and colleagues, um, I really became very frustrated that the medicines that we had access to, this is now 1998, 1999, um, for the treatment of myeloma were all hand-me-downs. They were medicines that it's fair to say weren't developed or discovered with the disease myeloma in mind, They were hand-me-downs from other successful or unsuccessful drug discovery efforts. Now, these medicines um, were very simplistic, melphalan and prednisone and autologous transplantation, um, but very helpful to patients. There were meaningful responses to these drugs, and uh, life was extended with these drugs. But I will tell you that the drugs that were developed for myeloma in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, all the way through to around the year 2000, they weren't directed at the disease itself. They were medicines that could kill myeloma cells at doses that would not kill patients. So crude early substances. And this was frustrating because of the work of Dr. Bergsegel, Dr. Anderson, and so many other in our field. Um, We knew quite a lot about the disease and yet there weren't companies set up to study just myeloma, at least at that time. And so I retrained in chemistry at Harvard um, with the idea that possessing this new understanding, molecular and genetic understanding of this disease, still incurable, that we might 
make our own drugs for myeloma. And when you take all of the things that a myeloma cell does that are toxic and all of the mutations that a myeloma cell possesses and all of the rearrangements of the chromosomes that can happen to lead to myeloma, one target rises to the top, and that's this gene that you spoke of called MYC. MYC is the master regulator of cell growth. It's a gene that normally lives and exists in your body. Everybody's born with two copies of MYC. And this gene exists so that during development, um, one cell can become two, and then a fetus, and then a child, and then an adult. There's so much cell growth in the body, and MYC is the master regulator of cell growth. If you make a mouse that has only one copy of MYC, well, it's smaller. Hmm. What happens in cancer, and this is true really of almost all, if not all, human cancers, is that the cell finds a way to keep MYC on. It fails to turn it off. It isn't necessarily that there's more MYC. It's just that it's lost the natural regulation of MYC. If, God forbid, you cut your arm and you lost a lot of blood, your bone marrow would turn MYC on so that you could make more blood. But then it would turn it off when there was enough blood made. What happens in cancer is that genetic events occur, as in myeloma especially, and the culmination of these genetic events is that MYC never shuts off. So it can be no surprise then that nowadays when cancers are genotyped and cancer genome sequencing has occurred on a grand scale, especially in myeloma, that we find, as Dr. Bergsagel apparently reported to you, that the number one most commonly activated gene in cancer and in myeloma is MYC. This is because MYC can be kept on by upstream pathways that signal to it, or the cancer cell can just short circuit, short step the whole process and activate MYC directly. How does this occur? Well, it can occur in myeloma, as Dr. Keel and Dr. Bergsagel have studied over many years, by taking a gene that's normally ripping on in a myeloma cell, the, the, the gene that would make immunoglobulins, and it will hook it up to MYC. Literally, the chromosomes will break apart, one at the immunoglobulin or antibody site in the genome, and the other at the MYC site in the genome, and then they will fuse back together. And now the MYC gene is taken out of its context where normally the body would say, well, we have enough plasma cells, please stop making them. But now that gene is hooked up to a faucet that never shuts off in that cell, the antibody faucet. And so learning this about myeloma, it seemed that how are we really going to cure this disease if we don't take care of what we call in my lab the MYC problem? The MYC problem is that all roads in cancer, and in blood cancers like myeloma especially, lead to MYC. The drugs that we use, the targeted drugs, act upstream of MYC. Drugs like Revlimid, we've uh, recently reported with Bill Kalin here, turn, um, function to turn off a gene called Icaros, which modulates a gene called IRF4, which eventually shuts off, guess what, MYC. So these incredibly effective drugs, like even glucocorticoids that can turn the MYC faucet down a little bit, eventually the myeloma cell figures how to turn MYC back on. We have a MYC problem in cancer. The responses commonly occur from shutting off an input to MYC, but then cancer finds a way to turn MYC back on. It's so clear then what we need. We need MYC inhibitors. And, and it sounds like you need to target MYC earlier in the process. I think so. You know, um, uh, uh, I was just at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, uh, last week for this uh, unbelievable conference on uh, the mechanisms and modeling of cancer and heard Gerard Evan from University of Cambridge speak, a world's leading expert on MYC, and he, he presented something quite remarkable. He showed that you can take another cancer-causing gene called KRAS, which is just one of the most active genes in the cell, and you can turn it on in a cell that's not yet a cancer, and it, and it, and it has a hard time making a cancer. But if you add just a whiff of MYC, you get a cancer out the other end. And so your question gets to, um, if MYC is so important for established cancers, 
could targeting MYC prevent cancers from happening at all? And I think this is a really exciting idea, but we would need medicines that target MYC. And so far, we have not yet one drug that can directly bind to and um, impair the function of the MYC gene. MYC is, in the parlance of the field of drug discovery, a term I hate called undruggable. Hmm. Undruggable just means that there's no drug yet for a given protein target, and MYC is the prototypical example. There's no drug for MYC, and I'll tell you it's not for lack of trying. People have been trying to drug MYC since 1984, 85, when it was discovered and characterized in the context of cancer. The problem with MYC is sort of like, I think the best analogy I can come up with, is the problem of uh, breaking through a wall with a locksmith. If you call the locksmith and you say, look, I'm having trouble getting into my car, they say, oh, no problem. They have tools to access the lock on a car, and they can get you in. But if you call a locksmith over to a brick wall and you say, look, I'm having trouble getting through this brick wall, they show up with their pins and their needles and their you know, screwdrivers, and they mm-hmm. say, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't have the tools needed to get through a wall. I, I, I make small keyholes function. You see, MYC lacks keyholes. As best we can tell, the MYC protein is a long noodle that winds up when it finds its partner, Max, to switch on all the growth genes in the cell. And when they get together, it's like watching two helices converge, like, a, like two dance partners connect. And there's no pocket. There's no open pore or hole where chemists like those in my lab, could imagine where to put the molecule. There's no keyhole to make the small molecule key or drug. So what it means then is if we're going to drug MYC and we're going to go down swinging, trying in labs like mine and others, is we're going to have to create new therapeutics uh, technologies that lead to perhaps a better way of studying MYC perhaps a better way of studying other types of mixed functions, new types of chemistry that can, can engage long, noodly proteins like MYC. I'm just not convinced that the therapeutic technologies we have today are suitable for drugging MYC. Maybe we have no drugs then because our drug discovery technologies are imperfect. And recognizing this as the doomsday scenario, you know, that Mm -hmm. we can make all the drugs in the world, but if we don't solve the MYC problem, it will be hard to cure cancer, definitively cure cancers. Um, I set up this lab at Dana-Farber, of all places, an academic center that has no drug discovery capability, with the idea that we wouldn't make drugs, but that we would study MYC and its completeness to try to find pathways that signal to MYC, to try to find ways of disabling MYC, ways of destabilizing MYC, ways of targeting the collaborators of MYC, ways of finding new collaborators for MYC and targeting them, thinking that maybe MYC doesn't act alone. And so I suppose you could say that a central theme of the research in my lab, these are chemists and biologists and biochemists and computer scientists who've come together not to make drugs. We're not a commercial operation but to make ideas, to make technologies that would, either here or in somebody else's lab, that would be fine too, um, to make, you know, first therapeutics that work to turn MYC off. And now we're dying to know what you've learned so far. (laughs) If they started in 1984 trying to target MYC, what have you learned about MYC in your lab? Yeah. Well, look, we're very respectful for the science of the last three decades, and we read it like the Holy Bible, trying to find insights um, or approaches that were learned or how to most effectively deploy new technologies. So I'll tell you, there are three ways that we're thinking about drugging, Mick, and I'll give you a progress report on all three, and we can get together in 10 years for the next one. My lab's only been open six years, so please regard this as a uh, work in progress, which it very much is. Let's take three different approaches to MYC. One I'll call upstream. What are the factors that turn MYC on? And could you target those factors such that you more effectively disable the faucet that is driving MYC? 
Second, let's target the collaborators of Mick. If Mick doesn't work alone, um, if it's the godfather of the cancer mafia, um, let's execute the family. What are all of the proteins that Mick needs to work with? And let's one by one develop chemical strategies for them. And then third, you know, we don't accept that Mick is undruggable. We think that with new types of chemistry, new types of therapeutic approaches, new drug discovery technologies that maybe, maybe we can in you know, 2014 do something that was impossible in 1984. Can we deploy new therapeutics technologies to directly target MEC, though it has been, and we're very respectful of this, you know, a holy grail in drug discovery for, for decades. So we have scientists organized around each of these three approaches, the upstream targeting of MEC, the collaborators of MEC, and directly targeting MEC. I'll tell you, the most progress that we've made in the lab so far has been the collaborators. It is um, possible now with modern proteomic scientists, science to find all of the binding partners of MEC. And we did that experiment right when I opened the lab, and we got a lot of insights of what types of proteins MIC might require to, um, to execute its, um, its cancerous functions. Number two is I hit the literature, looking for ideas or insights. Are there things that MIC does to cells, to the circuitry, that would point to new potential targets, things that didn't have a big literature about MIC, but just made good sense? In this vein, um, I came up with an idea to target a protein called BRD4. And I, I believe this must be the project that Dr. Bergsagel uh, referred to. BRD doesn't stand for Bradner. I wish it did. BRD4 stands for Bromo Domain Protein 4. More on that in a second. Well, MYC lives in the nucleus of the cell. This is the middle of the cell where the DNA lives. And what MYC does is it's the light switch that turns on the 5 to 15% of genes in the cell that are involved in growth. There are 25,000 genes, and about 2,500 of them are involved in cellular growth. And MYC is the master switch that turns them on. When MYC is on, the cell grows. When MYC is off, the cell can't grow. And though this is simplistic, and there are exceptions, it turns out to be generally true. So MYC helps the cell accomplish a metabolism that can make more building blocks to build a second cell right next door. MYC um, uh, helps to expand the ribosomes where proteins are made to allow uh, more cellular functions that are needed for cells to grow. And MYC also influences the proteins that control the checkpoints that keep cells from growing or not. MYC is the, is the, is the, the master conductor of the growth orchestra. And the way it does it is it sits down on DNA not on genes per se, but next to genes at places that are called enhancers. Enhancers enhance the expression of a gene. These are the switches that turn genes on and off. And MYC is an on switch. When MYC sits down at these enhancers next to genes, it flips the switch and the gene turns on. How does it do that? How does MYC turn genes on? And, and how does a cancer cell, when it goes through cell division and it makes two cells, how does it remember to turn the genes back on? How does it remember that it's cancer? Well, I'll summarize a lot of really complicated science, and we can go into it as much depth as you want. Mm -hmm. But MYC requires the function of post-it notes to remind it where to go. MYC sits on the DNA, and then it forms this assembly. It, it really brings an orchestra together to turn the gene on. And it tends to go to these places where there are post-it notes, little reminder notes that say, hey, Mick, you were just here in that last cell, and now we're trying to make another cancer cell again, so get back over here and turn this gene on. And these post-it notes are chemistry. They're chemical changes to the DNA and to the proteins that the DNA is wrapped around that though they don't change the sequence of the G DNA, the G, A, C's, and T's, the genetics of the DNA, they change the protein that the DNA is wrapped around, the epigenetic.
genetics of the genome. And when these chemical marks are placed, it's like Hansel and Gretel and their breadcrumbs. Now the cell can remember what genes to go back to to turn on. Cells can remember that they're cancer. One of these marks is called acetylation. And acetylation, I won't go too deeply into it, is an on switch mark. It goes wherever Mick goes, like breadcrumbs, these acetylation marks are placed behind. Bromo domains bind acetyl marks. And so the bromo domains are um, little bundles of protein that stick to, like a post it note, these chemical marks. So to rehash, MYC causes cancer, number one. Mm-hmm. MYC functions by switching on growth genes, number two. MYC remembers where to go, and thus cancer cells remember that they're cancer through epigenetic changes to the genome, one of which, the master of which, is called acetylation, and bromodomains bind acetylation marks and thus are the post-it notes that remind cells that they're cancer. So I got to wondering, among these 42 bromodomain proteins, are there any of them that MYC might just utterly require as a collaborator? And we found this protein called BRD4. And it turns out that for MYC to function in myeloma, it really needs this BRD4 protein to be nearby, like a drinking buddy, to, mm-hmm. uh, to, to function. And so chemists in my lab and biochemists in my lab organized around the challenge of making a first inhibitor of BRD4 to test in myeloma to see if it could turn off the MYC um, uh, um, switches. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Are we doing okay, Jenny? Are you yes. following this no. okay? Yes, All right. I am. Good, and I'm good, good. <laughs> and so, um, and so, uh, um, this was a highly collaborative effort, um, and uh, we got a lot of insights from the published literature. We got some insights from the patent literature. We got a lot of insights from collaborators, such as uh, Stefan Knapp, um, a brilliant crystallographer at Oxford University, and we would communicate on Skype and use Dropbox, and, um, and, uh, and Jun Chi, a chemist in my lab, made the very first inhibitor for BRD4 called JQ1, which he vainly named for himself, Jun Chi, mm-hmm. JQ1. And using this compound, we were able to show um, in myeloma that the MYC gene turns off. Now, this isn't a drug targeting MYC. This is a drug that targets MYC's collaborator. And so we wanted to test this compound in models of myeloma that might predict whether it's just a research experiment with just a chemical tool or where there was a real therapeutic opportunity, a translational opportunity to go from bench to bedside. And it's, it's very lucky to be here in Boston because we have arguably the world's leader in this kind of research, Ken Anderson and his lieutenants, who are now many of them on faculty here. And one of them, Constantine Mitziaitis, a brilliant Greek genius of myeloma biology, um, is here as well, and a very good friend. And so uh, Constantine and I teamed up our labs to study the JQ1 molecule in myeloma. And lo and behold, this drug turned the MYC gene off. And when it did that, the myeloma cells forgot they were myeloma, and they went to sleep, something we call cellular senescence, and they died. Okay, amazing. And so this, it's around the time in science you start to get really excited because what was this kind of basic science project? Can we turn off MYC with a drug that targets BRD4? And you got to understand, at this time, there weren't a lot of labs that even could spell bromodomain. They didn't know a lot of people cared about bromodomain proteins. And we were just trying them on for size. Um, all of a sudden, Constantine says, look, this is, spe- this is really something special. Have you ever thought about making a drug out of this JQ1? So this is around the time in science you get excited about treating some mice because unlike a Petri dish, a mouse has a brain and a heart and a liver and lungs, and you can learn whether what you have here is just dish soap something that would be great to kill cells, but you could never tolerate it as an ingestible product. 
um, or whether it really had drug-like properties. And um, it turns out that um, uh, Leif Bergsegel has developed what is, in my opinion, the most predictive mouse model of myeloma. And I hope he talked to you about this. It's actually very exciting work. It's a model that's driven by Mick, where the mice get a disease that looks just like myeloma. And Leif and his wife, Marta Casey, bothered to do the experiment that most scientists don't do. He took all the drugs that had ever been tested in myeloma in the clinic that he could get his hands on, and one by one, he put them through his model. And he said, do the drugs that work in humans work in the model? Yes or no? And do the drugs that don't work in the model work in humans? And, and it actually correlated really well that, by and large, the drugs that would provoke responses in the mouse were the drugs that worked in the humans. Drugs like Velcade, drugs like Carfilzomib, drugs like histone deacetylase inhibitors, melphalan, prednisone, doxorubicin, things that work in humans work in the mouse. That's called positive predictive value. But no, moreover, it's a great correlation. Oh, yeah. And moreover, drugs that did not work in his mouse tended not to work in humans. And there was one exception, Revlimid, but we understand that better now, and that's more for another time. So um, I, I emailed Bleef, and I said, you know, could you be interested to try this molecule in your model? We have this theory that maybe it turns off MIC, your model is driven by MIC, you know. And I'm always excited when experiments work in my lab, but I'm, I'm actually a little more excited when they work in somebody else's lab because we don't want to make the drug that only works in Boston. We want to make the drug that works in, you know, Scottsdale, Arizona, and Boston, mm -hmm. and, you know, wherever anybody tries this, right? The reproducibility issue in science is a big deal right now. And Leaf and Marta were lovely. And Jun sent them some compound, and they injected it into their mice. And, you know, we've gotten sort of used to, in cancer, drugs that will delay the progression of disease in a mouse or make the mouse live longer, which is no small feat, but it doesn't make the cancer go away. Mm -hmm. What was exciting to us in Leaf's model is that some of these mice had near complete remissions with, you know, a week or two weeks of the drug. And oh. Leaf's excitement and Constantine's excitement and Ken Anderson's excitement really got our lab excited because these guys have been living in this myeloma world for 20 years, and if they... They know. They just know what, what, what demands testing in humans. But, Jenny, now there's a problem. This JQ1 molecule from our lab is not a drug. This molecule's not super soluble. It's a molecule that we use in the lab like a prototype. It's mm -hmm. not the iPhone 5. It's not even the iPhone 1. You know, it's like a Texas Instruments computer. I mean, this is something that, that we made for for mice and for laboratory science, we didn't make it for humans. Dana-Farber is not a, a drug company. We don't have uh, manufacturing facilities. And their enthusiasm caused us to think differently about the project and that we would need to make a drug-like version of JQ1, and that's what we did next. That's amazing. So what is the next step after you determine that it does work in mice? I mean, you have to – you work it in the lab, you work it in mice, and then? Well, you know, um, the next experiment um, uh, is, is to try it in humans. Now, in order to get it in humans, we needed to find a version of our molecule that has properties that normally we don't care about in academia. Drug-like properties. Is it soluble? Is it bioavailable? Does it have a long half-life? Does it um, escape metabolism by the liver? Intellectual properties. It turns out to be really expensive to bring a molecule out of an academic lab and into humans. You know, what I've learned so far in science is that discovering drugs is pretty cheap and easy. Developing drugs is very expensive and very hard. And there are no grants for this type of work. Um, there is no grant to, um, you know, uh, take a molecule out of my lab and make it into pills or injectable vials and then carry it into the clinic. And so we need to be more creative 
um, to find partners, people who are as expert at developing drugs as a lab like mine is at discovering drugs. And the very best people in this type of work, believe it or not, are not in academia. They're drug companies. Mm -hmm. And so we did two things at this point um, that, um, uh, that I'd love to tell you more about. The first thing is that we're not a drug company. And so we have this one, I think there's one thing that we have an an easier time doing than drug companies do because they're so well resourced and they do such exceptional science, and that is share. Um, this is ordinarily the time in drug discovery where you go quiet, where you know you have something really cool, or maybe really cool, and you don't want to, you don't want competition, and maybe you file a patent or something, but you know maybe you maybe you keep it a secret until you have the drug of interest. And we're we're not a drug company. Dana Farber is a is a charity, and our lab really believes in in an open source philosophy. Um, you, you know, the availability and access to computer code has just transformed um, uh, the information technology and software arena. But um, drug discovery is famously very very secretive, and so we got to wondering. What if we did a social experiment? What if we were to um, take this, you know, transformative strategy from computer science, open source, and apply it to the most secretive science in the history of the world, you know, mm -hmm. um, drug discovery? Um, and, uh, and, and Jun and the lab were, were excited about this idea. And so we, we, we synthesized 100 grams of the JQ1 molecule, and we said so we make it freely available to any chemist, you know, worldwide, um, and provide them, you know, with the molecule like immediately and for free and without restriction on the quantity. Meaning that if they wanted to do an animal experiment, if they were studying, I don't mm -hmm. know, psychiatric disease, and the only good experiment was in a mouse, that we would give them a gram if that's what if that's what they would would want, and, and that would and that it would be free and immediately available. And, and you might think if you're not a scientist, like my, my older sister is a philosopher, she's like, well, it wasn't, isn't that how it is? I mean, don't, isn't that how science is? Don't you always get your science in the hands of other people? And, and the truth is, in chemistry, it's actually really hard to get drug molecules for open and unrestricted study. They are governed by very restrictive material transfer agreements. And so we thought we would experiment with this open source strategy. And it's with this strategy that we were able to get the molecule in the hands of Leif Bergsegel and that he was able to test it. And that we were um, – that um, uh, drug companies were able to get the compound and validate this science and show that not only does it work in myeloma, it works in lymphoma as well. It's how we were able to get the drug to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories to Chris Vakic and Scott Lowe. And they were able to say, well, gosh, this drug works really well in, in acute leukemia, something we've been studying in our lab as well. Um, through this strategy, we learned that the drug might work to reactivate HIV, something that you wouldn't think is a good idea, but it turns out the drugs are really effective in HIV, but the virus is hiding, and that this drug, much to our surprise, teases the virus out of hiding. We even learned that the molecule behaves of, as all things a male birth control pill. That's for another time. Hmm. Back to myeloma. So the open source strategy, which grew out of my lab, was able to point new directions where people with bromodomain drug molecules might take the molecules for the benefit of humans. And this research activity, I believe, telescoped what might have been 20 years of research, you know, down to a one to two year period where there was um, just an explosion in um, publications and I guess, for lack of a better word, just knowledge about the potential of BRD4 inhibition. But, you know, we learned early on through our work with Constantine of the promise in myeloma how to get a drug version of JQ1 to myeloma patients. And so um, Junchi um, uh, in the lab um, and I uh, worked to uh, develop a drug-like version of JQ1, something that had the drug-like properties and I suppose the intellectual properties needed um, to recruit the uh, commitment, expertise, investment, and organization of the biopharmaceutical world 
around the idea and opportunity to bring this mic directed therapy to to patients with myeloma and it took about um two years um but we made um a molecule um called ten ten t e n hyphen zero one zero that um is about maybe ten times more potent than j q one it lasts about ten times longer. Um, in the bloodstream than JQ1, and it's about 10, if not 100 times mm-hmm. more soluble than JQ1, and that's how it gets its name, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, uh, but we're not a drug company here, and so um, we tried to find uh, collaborators, um, experts in drug development um, who could help us, and we teamed up with uh, two guys, uh, Doug Onsey, a business person, and Steve Landau, uh, just... Um, the most brilliant drug developer I, I know, um, who could take um, this drug into humans. And over about um, 18 months, they did. And now uh, this technology, this molecule, sits um, at a company called Tensha Therapeutics that Dana-Farber and I and these two fellows started to try to bring this molecule to patients. Um, the update there is that about, um, I suppose, six or eight months ago, um, the molecule was first used um, in phase one clinical trials to establish the dose that's safe in humans. It's not a foregone conclusion that a new drug will be tolerated by humans. And um, uh, um, I believe two or three phase one clinical trials will be performed um, with this molecule in both solid and liquid tumors. Now, now this is all their story to tell, uh, but a myeloma study um, is planned, and um, uh, uh, I'd encourage you to talk, um, if you're interested, uh, to um, Steve Landau and Doug Ansi at Tensha Therapeutics more about this program. Though I'm a myeloma doctor still, um, you know, it wouldn't be right for me as a um, inventor of this molecule, you know, to also be the prescriber of this molecule. And Mm -hmm. uh, I now sit on the sidelines, you know, cheering and hoping that this can um, work in just the only relevant experiment um, in myeloma, and that is the care of patients with myeloma. Well, I think it's completely amazing, and I love how you use the open source strategy. So did you get a lot of takers when you did that? You know, we did. I would, We're just I would hope writing so. a story. Yeah, we did. We're just writing a story about this. And, you know, the only restriction on the drug is you can't eat it. Um, we got a lot of emails, very moving emails, from people in um, tough situations who uh, f- felt like they were running out of options, mm-hmm. um, who read the paper, and who mm-hmm. wanted to try even the prototype drug, JQ1. And it's... Um, and it's heartbreaking because this isn't a drug molecule, you know, and um, there are steps needed to bring a technology like this to the bedside. And by the way, it is still very uncertain whether this can work in humans as well as it does in leaves mice. Um, we got a lot of interest from the, the, the community. Um, to date, uh, Jun has, is now on the third 100-gram synthesis of this drug, and um, every week we mail out samples to researchers around the world, and I think more than 400 labs now have um, received a sample of JQ1 for um, a study in uh, just a broad number of disease areas and biological questions and um, to understand uh, MIC and, um, and, and other uh, master regulators um, in more detail. Um, and I, I have um, lost count of how many publications now, you know, feature the JQ1 molecule. But uh, for us, it's been really exciting because you know you you hope as a chemist that people will be fascinated by your molecule. And if you get a couple of emails, even you know that someone's willing to test it in a this that or the other thing, it's it's very exciting. And, and to hear. 400 labs, you know, become interested in the drug has for Jun been, I think, um, you know, uh, the experience of a lifetime. Oh, absolutely. And it seems that this is um, a model that is the the founder of Carfilzomib sounds like 
did the same model, and I interviewed him very early on in the series. And it, he mentioned this valley of death that happens between you as a researcher coming up with a solution in this new molecule, molecule and then actually getting it to the point where a drug company can develop it with drug companies sometimes not wanting to take a lot of risk, but it is possible to, to cross that valley of death and get it over. So congratulations to you for well, listen, starting Well, listen, I appreciate your, appreciate your congratulations, but I want to be the first to say, and I want want you to hear me loud and clear. We have done nothing. This is just now getting to the point where we can learn if this science can help people. And I'm not being modest. This is the the God's honest truth that, um, you know, we live in an era where it's possible with science to uh, have a measurable impact on patients, on a disease. And working in this environment at Dana-Farber around guys like Ken Anderson and um, uh, uh, Rich Stone, Dan D'Angelo, um, you know, my heroes who have uh, brought science to bear on a problem in the clinic. Um, with all respect, Jenny, and I know it comes from a good place, you know, uh, it's just too early for congratulations. But with that said, with that said, um, yes, I think that Academic centers can play more of a role and are playing more of a role in um, addressing the shortcoming of modern therapeutics. We, we ought not behave like drug companies and get ahead of ourselves, but if there is a group or a department with a real area of expertise, like my colleague Nathaniel Gray here, the world leader on the study of kinases, you know, he's been doing nothing but kinases for 15 years, and the level of sophistication and creativity that he brings to bear on this pathway now is really something to watch. Um, and his science um, um, helps address this, this gap that exists uh, between basic fundamental knowledge of cancer and our ability to act on that information. Um, so hopefully from, from our lab, you know, more stories like this will will arise. Um, we're not a drug company. We're not trying to act like one. And I don't even call what we do in my lab drug discovery. We like to think that if we study a pathway with chemistry and if we make molecules that can answer questions about pathways in the cell and if we share openly and effectively with colleagues who deeply understand disease that... Um, that uh, connections will be made of therapeutic relevance um, and that drugs will then emanate from these efforts. And sure enough, over the first six years of the lab, um, you know, three, three times now, therapeutics have uh, transitioned um, into the clinic. We have, you might know, um, another molecule in phase two for myeloma, um, now at a company called Acetylon, um, an inhibitor of HDAC6. Um, uh, that's being studied in combination with uh, both proteasome inhibitors and, and separately with um, with uh, with IMIDs. Um, so, um, like Craig Cruz, the founder um, of uh, Proteolix, um, um, I do think that there is a, uh, a big opportunity for pathway biologists to um, to catalyze um, the uh, development of breakthrough therapeutics. Well, it seems like creating this um, transitional infrastructure, I guess you could say, like he did with Proteolix, is effective. You know, it works for him. Yes. Oh, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Proteolix is an amazing story. You know, um, in the case of Proteolix um, and the carfilzomib molecule, an inhibitor of the proteasome, um, it, w it was guided, of course, by the development of, of bortezomib, the uh, pro first proteasome inhibitor in the clinic. And that was guided by the, a drug called MG132. This was a chemical tool like JQ1 that was available for scientists to study the principal garbage disposal system of the cell. And uh, Ken Anderson and other colleagues in the myeloma area used these tools to establish that the proteasome was a great target for myeloma cells. And um, so... Uh, you know, carfilzomib owes a debt of gratitude to bortezomib, which owes a debt of gratitude to these 
chemical tools that help to guide uh, drug discovery. And uh, so I'm a big believer, as you can tell, um, uh, in um, open access to chemical tools because it helps uh, clinical scientists learn how to deploy these powerful and targeted uh, new therapeutic weapons. Well, it seems the greatest advantage is speed when you when you talk about the open access. It is. And, you know, I'm um, still doctoring. And uh, this week I'm on the stem cell transplant service at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And it's very orienting these weeks um, on the wards with, um, you know, patients in impossible situations. And uh, there's, a, a, there's an aspect of speed that is scientific strategy. How can we, you know, move our science as a field as forward as fast as possible? Uh, but uh, this time with patients is so orienting because, uh, you realize the um, uh, how um, how how vital um, uh, time really is, um, and uh, uh, it's 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 frustrating to me um, that drug development um, uh, moves so slowly relative to the um, urgency of need in the clinic, and uh, I, I know that my colleagues in clinical drug development are working as hard as we are in drug discovery to um, identify efficiencies of pace and how breakthrough drugs can be accessed more more easily. I regret I'm not an expert in that area, um, but um, time is our enemy, and we must be as creative with our scientific strategies as we are with our science. Well, I love what you're doing. Thank you for trying something new. <laughs> Yeah. And and seeing where it will take you, I had a backup question, if you don't mind, on the HDAC Please. inhibitors. Sure. I I saw that you are doing work with the ACY 1215, and Correct. wondered if it relates to MIC or if it's completely separate. Well, it's a little bit of both, as it turns out. Um, so ACY 1215 uh, is a is a investigational drug molecule that targets a histone deacetylase. Now, interestingly, HDAC, which is what it's short for, are a group of enzymes that remove the post-it note. They erase the, the mark, um, this acetyl mark. They pull it off. And so one way of thinking in our field is if you remove the mark, maybe Mick forgets what to do, right? I mean, if, if mm-hmm. here right. we're making the reader of the mark blind with JQ1, what if you remove the mark? That would mean inhibiting the HAT, the acetyl transferase. Another way to go might be, what if you block the removal of the mark? You know what happens? The mark starts showing up all over the place. You lose control of the mark, and the cell gets confused like a smoke screen, and some cancer cells will die if the mark is starts to appear in an un- regulated way. And so um, we're kind of excited, as you can tell, well, easily, (laughs) but we're excited uh, about (laughs) about anything related to these acetylation marks, anything related to these epigenetic marks. We think that there needs to be a molecule for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, And so HDACs, the enzymes that remove the marks, turn out to be very druggable. Um, And, uh, uh, and, and, and so my lab remains active in trying to make a chemical toolbox for the study of the 18 enzymes that remove these marks, 18 and counting. And um, uh, early on, uh, when I was at the Broad Institute and in training at Harvard Chemistry with Stuart Schreiber, um, we teamed up with Ken Anderson to make first inhibitors of an HDAC called HDAC6. And I won't bore you with the details, but um, um, the theory is that HDAC6 is involved in the handling of proteins. And as you know, myeloma cells make more protein than they can stand, and it spills over into the blood, and that's often uh, how we measure the burden of disease in myeloma. And so drugs like the proteasome inhibitors that gum up the protein handling system are active in myeloma, uniquely active in myeloma. Could inhibition of HDAC6 work the same way? And so um, with Stuart Schreiber, um, in chemistry, I developed 
Uh, and importantly, uh, um, one of my very best friends in science, Ralph Mazichak, a brilliant synthetic chemist now at MGH, but we shared an office at the Broad. We developed prototype inhibitors of HDAC6. And then Ken Anderson tested these compounds with Teru Hidashima in his lab. And um, lo and behold, they were highly synergistic with proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib and carfilzomib. And so what's interesting is that these drugs do not do anything by themselves. They, they don't do anything to myeloma cells when used alone. They turn out to be great partners for other drugs. So, Jenny, here's something really interesting, is that we always use cancer drugs in myeloma most effectively in combination, mm-hmm. yet nobody makes drugs that only work in combination. Right? I mean, oh, by and right. large, companies want to make drugs that work on their own, that can stand on their own two feet, that they can sell without having to worry about some other drug. Um, that means we're missing a whole class of drugs, synergizers, facilitators, drugs that would work when combined. And so we thought that's a good academic project. And so Ralph and Stewart and Ken and Teru and I teamed up to try to make drugs in the HDAC class that would be um, – well, great partners for for other drugs like thalidomide, revlimid, or like bortezomib, carfilzomib. In any event, Ken and Teru's studies showed that these HDAC6 inhibitors were great were great partners. But by the way, HDAC3 inhibitors were good partners too. And so we took this toolbox of HDAC inhibitors and we said to Ken, well, we, it doesn't really matter to us what the winner is, just what's the winner? And it was a mm-hmm. compound called 161. 161 was a lot like JQ1. It wasn't a drug. It was a tool. But when we put it into mice, the mice did great. And so we got excited about making a drug-like version of 161. Uh, And um, so we teamed up uh, with a real expert named John Van Duzer uh, to make a drug version of 161. And that drug is called 1215. And Mm -hmm. like uh, Tensha, uh, that technology sits in its own company called Acetylon. Mm -hmm. And in a uh, um, collaboration with Celgene, uh, that drug is now being tested in a large number of clinical trials that the, the company has settled on. Uh, now, I should tell you, um, uh, uh, these molecules are like uh, children of mine off to college. You know, like mm-hmm. uh, we have everything invested in this technology. The idea, um, the molecules are molecules that I co-invented with these friends, um, Dane Farber, um, my lab and myself have stock in these companies, and I, I want to explain to you the conflict of interest that exists there. Um, uh, but but I, but the experiment that will establish whether or not these molecules matter at all will be performed by other people, um, and is being performed with our patients um, and um, uh, leaders in the myeloma field. So the HDAC work connects to MYC. It wasn't the rationale for using those drugs, but I think MYC, you know, needs HDAC inhibitors, needs HDACs too, um, like collaborators for MYC. Uh, and, um, and we should learn in the next year to two year, um, you know, how bromodomain inhibitors work in myeloma alone or in combination and how HDAC inhibitors work alone or in combination. And it would be great and exciting from a science standpoint if it were the drugs from my lab that carry the day. But, Jenny, we deeply don't care. We just want the answer. You know, mm-hmm. can these two classes of drugs, um, you know, help patients with myeloma? So my final question will be, because it's just such exciting work, is what are your next steps and then how can we help you? And then I'll open up for a couple caller questions. Sure. Well, the next steps for us is, you know, we roll back up our sleeves and, and, and get back to work trying to find the next, you know, generation of myeloma drugs. Um, we're very interested in the MM-SET protein, which is um, a common and, um, and uh, a poor prognosis um, uh, partner in the 414 fusion in myeloma. We need drugs for that target. My guys are working really hard on that. We need to make these direct MYC inhibitors, and we're going to go down swinging. This project is our Higgs boson. This may mm-hmm. run 10, 20 years. Uh, it's not easy to get that funded, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a critically important science project, and you know we're not trying to, to own it. We'll collaborate with anybody that wants to, to work on that big challenge. 
Um, and so if, if you walk through my lab right now, the lights are on, everybody's here, and, uh, and they're trying to drug Mick. They're trying to drug the Mick partner. They're trying to drug uh, MM set. They're, they're, they're trying to create the next generation of prototypes you know, from which um, uh, the pros in, in the pharmaceutical industry can, can make the next generation of, of, of breakthrough therapeutics. How can you guys help? Um, uh, you know, th- it's a team effort, and um, uh, my lab and I are, are genuinely um, uh, honored by your interest. And um, I get these emails uh, uh, from people um, that are so uplifting, and we, we put them right up on the bulletin board um, to uh, make sure these you know, young chemists and biochemists who aren't doctors and don't spend time with patients know, you know, how, um, how much this community supports, um, um, their science. And, uh, so thank you for that. It means, it means quite a lot to us. And, you know, if you, uh, walk, um, uh, with the Dana-Farber or bike in the PMC or, uh, or, uh, jog with the MMRF or, uh, uh, are in the team in training or light the night with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, um, you know, one thing is true is that, um, uh, this country and this, uh, Boston community in particular, uh, does so much, uh, to help, um, uh, support, um, uh, science that, uh, um, ours and others, um, that it it, 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 it it matters quite a lot. And um, this philanthropic support and the foundation support that we get for these ambitious, high-risk, high-reward projects is is just our, our most vital source of support. And so for, you know, all um, the listeners to this program do to support blood cancer research, um, you know, uh, let me say thanks. Hmm. Well, we so appreciate what you're doing. So I think that's that's the minimum that we can do. I'd like to open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Bradner, you can call 347-637-2631. And we'll start with caller at 983-6757. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Bradner. Thank you so much for thinking out of the box. I'm a smoldering patient. My name is Dana Holmes. And I truly, just sitting here listening, um, tried to capture a great deal of it, and most of it, uh, it was very well explained, and I thank you for breaking it down into terms where the lay person and the lay patient could, could really try to follow along. So thank you for that. Um, I have a few questions. I understand that the MIC gene activation can occur through chromosome translocations, but it also can be deregulated through amplification. Could could you take a minute to explain the difference between a translocation cause or an amplification cause? I know there are two different um, situations. Am I correct? That is a really sophisticated question. Oh, okay. is it? Oh, no. It is, and I'm, I'm happy to answer stuff. it. And no, I'm saying oh. So, okay, I'm going to give you the scientific answer first. Okay. They're the same. The scientific answer is that Translocation and amplification are basically the same biological event. DNA is broken, and it gets stitched back together. Sometimes in a translocate. now let me tell you the differences as regards Mick, because he asked about Mick. Mick needs to get turned on, needs to be activated. And one way is it gets hooked up to a way bigger switch than it ever needed. Um, uh, um, normally, MIC has this little dimmer switch next to it that gives you just the amount of MIC you need. But when a translocation happens and the MIC chromosome breaks and it reconnects to another chromosome, like the antibody chromosome that has a huge switch on it, you start making way more MIC than you ever wanted. So a MIC translocation can happen where MIC hooks up to a new chromosome. An amplification all happens on the MIC chromosome, where all of a sudden, because of breakage and rejoining events, the number of MIC genes next to each other is 2 or 3 or 8 or 20. So what you get are you get 20 copies of the gene where you used to only have one. But it doesn't actually break off and find it, another part. Well, it does break. I meant That's what I was trying to explain, mm-hmm. is that 
it breaks, but then it reconnects right next door on the same chromosome. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a scientist here at, 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 um, at Harvard called Fred Alt. Frederick Alt. We just wrote a paper together on this phenomenon that he's been studying his whole career in B cells that talks about the way that chromosomes break and rejoin. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it turns out that amplifications and translocations, especially in B cells, use the same machinery. But if the gene hooks up to a new chromosome, we call it a translocation, mm-hmm. if the gene hooks up to the same chromosome um, with now a new copy of that gene right next to it, it's called an amplification. Okay. And in typically, which translocation occurs in multiple myeloma? Is it the 814? Well, myeloma features a whole bunch of different translocations. And mm-hmm. um, uh, the Keel Lab will tell you um, just a whole list of them. Translocations of chromosome 13 in myeloma are quite common, uh, as are translocations of NIC. Uh, but there's just a, a goodly number of, of myeloma translocations to um, too long a list to even. Oh enumerate. no, right. I I know yeah. the common ones, the 11, 14, 4, 14, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I I wasn't aware of which chromosome is the C mc gene found on. Well, it, it depends if we're talking about, you know, mice or, or in, in humans. Mm-hmm. Um, chromosome 8 is okay. the location of the MYC oncogene in, in, in human cells. Okay, okay. Because that's not a routinely tested for um, translocation on fish panels from what I've gathered. Because I know uh, I've, I've never had it. Yeah, it it, it would depend on the lab that's, that's, right. that's trying to do that. The um yeah, so so Mick is on what's called the long arm, a chromosome eight, and um, it commonly is translocated into the um, uh, immunoglobulin uh, heavy chain locus. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, the the um, human uh, uh, immunoglobulin locus has a number of of partners um that it can go to mick mm-hmm. just being one of them mm-hmm. uh in myelomas um you'll find cyclin d1 mm-hmm. on chromosome 11 um uh, uh mass on chromosome 20 um fgfr3 um you know and mm set uh translocations occur um short arm chromosome 4 i mean there's a bunch of them there's just a bunch of them Right. The yeah. reason why I ask is when, when Jenny interviewed Dr. Keel, um, I had given him a little bit of information about my own biology, and he was the one that brought up and planted the seed of, of, of the C. mic gene, possibly in my case. So I'm still, again, I'm smoldering. It's, um, I have to really um, establish where I'm at. I haven't had a bone marrow biopsy in, in two years, so I think it's time for, for that. Um, but for, for me, in my case, I'm actually cyclin D1 positive in my bone marrow through immunohistochemistry on a core okay. biopsy sample, yeah. but my fish panel was actually negative for 1114. So I, I understand that in theory I should have that translocation 1114. But I, I also had a plasma cell labeling index performed on those cells, and um, using that technique, the the result was zero. So I didn't have any turnover or proliferation, I guess, of the cells. But the pathologist who did it said, well, your cells are expressing cyclin D1 like crazy. Uh, And he was actually very surprised that fish did not pick up the 1114. So I was wondering, could the MYC, could I have a MYC translocation that they didn't discover or an amplification that could possibly be behind this cyclin D1 deregulation? Well, it's easiest to answer your question in the broadest sense, not Mm -hmm. as much about your disease, which would just be impossible to do by telephone. What I can tell you is that from what it sounds like, you've had all the appropriate clinical testing. With Mm -hmm. that said, uh, modern genetic testing five years from now will probably look very different. Um, You know, we are only in the last five years able to completely sequence the whole human and thus cancer genome with the efficiency needed to look at a patient's genome. And our current technologies are only so good for capturing translocations. They're great for point mutations. They're just okay for translocations. So um, my instinct is that in the fullness of time, 
mm-hmm. when cancer genome sequence, and this, by the way, could be 10 years from now, but um, my uh, um, instinct is that in the fullness of time, uh, cancer genome sequencing will capture um, amplification, translocation, point mutation, alterations in coding genes, alterations in non-coding genes. Um, but at the current moment, the gap between the measurements that, you, that you're asking about, alterations mm-hmm. and amplifications and translocations of MYC, are specialized studies that um, are often not, not necessary in the smoldering myeloma um, circumstance. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, but, but about cyclin D1, you can get a gene um, very highly expressed through translocation, through amplification, or by just direct gene expression. Um, we've been studying genes in my lab now that are um, highly activated by things we call super enhancers. It just sounds so crazy. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's interestingly enough often not a genetic event. It's an epigenetic event that we um, have been studying with Rick Young at the Whitehead Institute, a leader in uh, gene regulation biology. And some genes will make a lot of a protein just because there's a huge switch next to it. And it didn't, like, move there through a genetic event. It was built by the cell's um, program, uh, gene regulatory program. So this is my way of saying there's, there's like, any number of ways of having a, a lot of cyclin D1. Okay. All righty. Um, is, is CMYC typically a secondary event in myeloma, or is it, could it be also primary? I'd be shocked if Mick wasn't involved even in the earliest pathogenesis of, mm-hmm. of, of myeloma, the disease. But it is true from um, uh, the Berg, Sagal, and Keel labs that um, as the disease progresses, and especially after lines of therapy, um, rearrangements, activation, and the abundance of Mick um, only grows. So okay. I think it's probably involved in initiation and progression. Well, I thank you for... Um, enlightening me and educating me. It's really been such a pleasure listening to the show today. Um, And, again, thank you for all you do and and for your staff that are so passionate about it. Oh, thank you. This has been a a fantastic experience. Thank you again. Thank you, Dana. And we have one final caller, so please go ahead with your question. Um, Hey, Jenny and uh, Dr. Bradford, thanks for taking the call. Sure. So... um, I think, Dr. Brenner, I think you're modest in your response and saying no, nothing to congratulate me on yet. But uh, I think the congratulations that Jenny was talking about is appropriate. It's not, not for any success that you've had in the labs, but for the open and collaborative approach you're taking. I mean, thank you for taking or hitting the accelerator on getting your research into the field and getting it and getting faster independent validation. I think that's where the collaboration and, and open mind for your open mindedness and your approach is is actually well deserved. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, uh, I, it, it it has to kind of make you sad in a way that um, an open strategy to science could be, even by your comments, celebrated. I mean, I, more and more yeah. in this in this field, I, I start to think of science with a with a service mindset. You know, when you in the clinic, you're providing a service a perspective, a recommendation, um, a type of training that helps you help people make better decisions. Science isn't all that different. You know, it's a, the folks in my lab have a specialized training set that really on its own is not that unique, but, but together is very powerful, the interdisciplinary or, or, or team science that, that our lab, like many, many other labs, by the way, are capable of, you know, and, and, they, and, and, and they want to have an impact. You know, I'll tell you something. Um, when I was training as a scientist over the last 20 years, um, it, was a, it was a different era. You know, you, you would think about, well, what, is, what are you going to be known for? What is your big discovery? Or, you know, what would your Nobel Prize say? Ridiculous. The current young scientists with, and I'm not being just light about this, like with Facebook and Twitter and Tinder and all these other programs that they should probably not be doing while they're at work, they, they want to be connected to people. They don't understand waiting. They don't understand getting up and changing the television channel, right? They, their Science for them needs to be as immediate, as social, as connected, I think, 
as the, everything else in their lives. And so what seemed like a new idea for me and for Jun when we started discussing it with the group was immediately accepted by them because they thought it was awesome that they could, in their position as young scientists, connect to Harold Varmus, the Nobel Prize winner at the NIH, that they might share an email with him would be exciting for them. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, I really appreciate what you're saying because it felt innovative at the time that we started doing it. But I think this next generation of science you know, will just be culturally influenced in the most positive way by the the move of this young generation of scientists in their daily lives to a highly collaborative, spirited, efficient, impatient, you know, um, way of life. And it'll be or great imp- for patients. Well, imp- impatient is the name of the radio show. It's impatient, and that's that's really, you know, probably the, the main focus and core of what Jenny's doing is to hit the accelerator. So this has been a very appropriate show. I, I think the misalignment of incentives has thwarted much of the progress that could have been made to date. And, uh, and so I just, just want to highlight this moment and say thank you. And it's, it's, it, it hasn't gone unnoticed. I really appreciate it. I, I only wish I was a mouse. Maybe, maybe then I could get faster <laughs> access to health care. <laughs> You know, that that sounds like a bumper sticker I'd put on the car. <laughs> okay, so my last comment is, what else can I do to accelerate as a patient, to accelerate healthcare care um, and delivery of, of these opportunities? So let's talk specifics about something that maybe we could we could help out with. Um, I know I know I've I, – um, and, and one of the things we can do as patients is funding. So if you want to, you know, hit, you know strange collaboration with the patients to another level – you know, could we do crowdsourcing of funding for these initiatives? Um, I mean, we can't spend the money when we're gone, so maybe we can spend it in advance and 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 put money towards projects that have promise, but that may be underfunded and through financing could be accelerated. So, if that's something that can be helpful, then you know we're raising our hands, saying, what you know, where do we donate? And we have donated to the different organizations to the the Moore Foundation. We've donated uh, to MMRF. We donated to, to the I, um, the the one on the East Coast, um, uh, Susie's organization, oh, and West Coast. Uh, yeah. IMF. Uh, West Coast, sorry, IMF, yes, and uh, and so, but but in terms of just really this this, this I guess this valley of death that, that Jenny talked about, what can we do to help fill that? Valley of Death for promising targets, and what else is out there? Well, that's also a really generous question. I'll say this. Um, I've had a chance to watch the MMRF very closely, and um, being on the board of directors now uh, of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and of the American Society of Hematology to watch all three of these charitable organizations very, very closely. And I can tell you, without any hesitation, that the job that they do to steward the allocation of these precious resources from philanthropic activities like you're describing is beyond reproach. They are expert. They care deeply about the mission. All three organizations um, that that are just the three I'm most familiar with, by the way, there are surely others, Um, they're putting the money to use in the most efficient and um, explosive, ambitious way possible. They're responsible stewards of that investment. With that said, um, I think it's also quite an experience if you have occasion to connect with an idea, um, a scientist, a lab, a group of scientists, an institution – to um, join forces beyond the checkbook. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, there, there are opportunities. I um, have a member of my lab, I consider him, is, um, got an email from a fellow who said, you know, um, my dad is sick uh, with cancer. Uh, I commute every day to my high-powered computer science job. 
I love your idea of open source. Um, I'm not going to move. I don't know anything about cancer biology, but I am a whiz with a computer. What can I do to help? And we put him right to work. And our computer software that we write um, is good. It's not Google good. It's not, um, you know, uh, Oracle good. And this fella takes this software and turns it into something so special, and he's doing it on the train commuting in every day. It is openness and science taken to the next level. Now, in that case, that's a, that's, wow. that's a, that's a family member of a patient. Um, but it has been a powerful experience for us both. Um, I know that here at Dana-Farber we have um, a group, a visiting committee of people whose lives have been affected or businesses or, um, or, or they themselves are suffering from myeloma in all of its um, various stages. And I have no doubt they make contributions to the organization or individual labs here. You know, but they assemble um, at least once, if not twice a year. And the scientists and, and me among them present to them um, our update assurances that we have our foot on the accelerator firmly depressed. Um, so these organizations are wonderful, if not the best way, of putting the vital community resource of philanthropic giving to work in the most effective way possible. Um, but if there is a lab or an idea that really resonates with you, you know, either philanthropically or personally, I, I think there are ways to connect to it that are very special life experiences. Thank you for being being open to that. And that's fun that you were creative enough to just accept the guy who wanted to to code for you on the way to work. <laughs> yeah. So this, but it's, it's that it's that spirit of well, let's try it. What the heck? That's it's fun. unbelievable, and and it cracks yeah. me up because we can never afford him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, th- hey, thanks for taking the call. You bet. Thank you. Dr. Bradner, thank you so much for joining us today. It has com- been completely enlightening and very so inspiring and encouraging. So it's work like yours that will continue to drive really exciting discoveries in myeloma. We're so thankful you're working on these targets, and um, we look forward to your updates. Absolutely. And uh, Amina, when I say it, this is a... Uh, really unique experience. I've I've never been on an internet radio program before, never had a chance to connect with this uh community in this way and uh anyway, I hope I left you with the um the clear message that um you know, we're we're working just as hard as we can um to uh to eradicate this this um this horrible disease. Well, thank you so much for all you're doing. It was so helpful and so well explained. All right. Well, th- thank you, Jenny. Okay, thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. When Cynthia came to TurboTax, she had just launched her new side gig, a true crime podcast. I'm a first-rate detective with a golden voice. As her TurboTax expert, I made her second income count by guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and her maximum refund. Mm. What did she do with that refund? Find out next week. Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live.